Well, welcome everybody to the Washington Foreign Press Center and welcome to our colleagues in New York joining <coughs> there. We're very pleased to have today Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Daniel Russell. He's here to provide a preview of the 7th U.S.-China Strategic and Economic Dialogue, the SNED, as well as the consultation on people-to-people -people exchange, the CPE, that will be taking place in Washington, D.C. next week. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to cede the podium directly to the Assistant Secretary, and then we'll move to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Thanks to all of you here in Washington and in New York. I'm glad to be back at the Foreign Press Center, this time with some uh, American uh, domestic uh, press as well as the international press. Um, I was here just after Secretary Kerry's recent trip to uh, Asia, so I think you're up to date. Um, I haven't been counting, but Cynthia says if I back one more time to brief, uh, I'll get a free Starbucks. So. <laughs> So let me dive right into the, the topic of today, the uh, annual U.S.-China Strategic and Economic Dialogue, the SNED. Uh, this is our seventh, yes, count them, seventh uh, SNED. It begins uh, next week and will be co-chaired by the Secretary of State, John Kerry, and the Secretary of Treasury, uh, Jack Liu, with their counterparts uh, from China. Uh, State Councilor Yang Jiechi and uh, the Vice Premier uh, Wang Yang. I'll brief on the three elements of our dialogue next week: uh, the Strategic and Economic Dialogue (SNED), uh, the S the S Strategic Security Dialogue (SSD), which is a part of uh, the SNED. Sorry for all the acronyms. Uh, that is co-chaired uh, by Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken on the U.S. side and uh, Executive Vice Foreign Minister Zhang Yasui on the Chinese side. And the uh, U.S.-China consultation on people-to-people -people exchange, uh, what we call the CPE, uh, which is co-chaired by Secretary Kerry and uh, Vice Premier Liu Yandong. My understanding, Cynthia, is that tomorrow someone from Treasury will be here at the Foreign Press Center to brief on... Actually, that's a, a separate single hit that they're doing, but we I will see. share the transcript of that when it comes out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Defer to the experts on that. Um, but I won't cover the economic track. Let me start, though, with a little bit of context. The strategic rebalancing to the Asia-Pacific region that has unfolded, taken shape, over the last six and a half years has a couple of elements, modernizing our alliances and strengthening our partnerships, participating in and building up the regional institutions, promoting universal values, engaging economically to create jobs here at home and in the region, and working with the emerging powers. And key among the emerging powers, of course, is China. The U.S. has worked year after year to help make space for China's growth. We've welcomed China's emergence on the world stage and participation in the global system. The U.S. and China have a very complex, very consequential relationship. We don't always see eye to eye, but the fact is that global challenges require that we cooperate. They require collaborative solutions. So the U.S. works to find common ground with China. We work to expand areas of practical cooperation with China. Uh, we talk through, we work through our differences. We seek to solve problems. and to manage the problems that we can't seem to solve. And that's what the SNED is all about. There are, I would say, f sort of four attributes of the SNED that uh, help make it effective. First, and importantly, it's a very high-level dialogue. It's our flagship in the dialogue mechanisms that we have developed. Uh, and the access that 
these meetings give us to senior officials helps us to get our messages across and it helps us to get things done. For example, it was very valuable last year in preparing for the Obama-Xi summit meeting in Beijing uh, following APEC. Uh, and I know that in a similar vein, it will help us a great deal to prepare for the planned uh, summit meeting in Washington uh, this fall. Second, it's a broad-based uh, dialogue. This year, I think by my count, we've got at least nine different U.S. agencies participating just in the strategic track alone, and something like eight cabinet-level officials uh, from the U.S. side who uh, will engage across both tracks. Related to that, thirdly, uh, the SNED gives us the opportunity to work across the span of the Chinese interagency. Uh, and that's essential to ensuring that everybody in their system is similarly on the same page. Uh, the Chinese side is broadly represented by multiple agencies and, very importantly, by their military, uh, the PLA. I'd say the fourth attribute is continuity. Um, this allows us to build on past progress. It allows us to dig down more deeply and more deeply on uh, important issues. I think I've been to five of the uh, SNEDs, and they unquestionably serve to advance the agenda. You know, last year's dialogue, just as an example, was instrumental in teeing up uh, progress on the climate deal that President Obama and President Xi were, were able to uh, announce in November. This year promises further cooperation on climate. We're still the two largest emitters in the world. Uh, we're trying to position ourselves uh, and lead, frankly, the international community into the Paris uh, conference where we seek to make real progress in, in December. So Secretary Kerry and Secretary Liu will uh, chair a joint session uh, focusing on how the U.S. and China can work to reduce emissions, how we can make energy cleaner. There will also be uh, a second joint session on how we can work together to preserve and to protect the oceans and the marine environment more broadly. There will be a third joint session that focuses on how we can collaborate to provide uh, support for developing countries and for those countries that are emerging from crisis. China has a growing ability to make a positive impact uh, beyond its own borders. And, for example, its work to combat Ebola in West Africa uh, was important and was a milestone. China's assistance to Afghanistan has been essential to uh, creating a, an environment that fosters the smooth transition of that country. The point is there's a lot that the U.S. and China can do uh, together uh, in other regions uh, as well as in the Asia-Pacific to reduce poverty and to promote prosperity. In addition to working on the global issues that I just mentioned, uh, and in addition to working on some of the other global issues like terrorism, like proliferation, like wildlife trafficking, the strategic track importantly allows us to also uh, hold deep discussions on important regional issues. That includes uh, problem areas like North Korea, like Afghanistan. Uh, it relates directly to the uh, work that we're doing in the P5 plus one talks uh, with Iran, uh, talks that are uh, coming to a head uh, this month. And these are issues where uh, we seek to work together. They're issues where 
on policy were generally in close alignment. But it also includes problems like the maritime t uh, territorial disputes in the South China Sea where we have very significant differences. And the strategic track allows us to dig down on these problems. It also allows us to discuss our concerns about human rights in China. And that's a topic that is a feature of all of our engagement and every high-level uh, dialogue that we have. The point is we don't paper over these differences. We don't turn a blind eye to problems. We discuss them. We seek to tackle them directly. So when it comes to human rights, um, I have no doubt that the issue of the constriction of space for civil society to operate in China, the obstructions that you journalists face operating in China, uh, the very problematic NGO law, the draft law that has elicited so much uh, concern <laughs> and opposition. I, I have no doubt that these uh, are among the issues that uh, can and will be taken up uh, over the course of the uh, strategic and economic uh, dialogue in the CPE. I'm also sure that in light of uh, yesterday's LegCo vote in Hong Kong on universal suffrage that uh, there will be a, some discussion of the situation there as well. And maybe that's a good place to mention the, uh, the strategic security dialogue, the SSD, in a little more uh, detail. Um, the SSD, uh, which started, uh, I guess, five years ago, is a sub-dialogue. It's a dialogue under the SNED that is uh, led by uh, Deputy Secretary Tony Blinken on the U.S. side, as I mentioned, and by Zhang Yasui, the former ambassador to Washington, now executive vice foreign minister. What's valuable and unique about the SSD is the way in which it brings together both uh, diplomatic <coughs> officials and military officials from both sides, uh, people from our defense establishment and our uniformed military along with our uh, top diplomats, brings them together in the same room and enables them to tackle an agenda that contains the most difficult, most sensitive, most vexing security issues that we face. And these are the issues that have the potential to drive strategic mistrust in the relationship, which is what we <coughs> seek to avoid. That includes issues about how we engage and deal with each other in cyberspace issues about how we engage and deal with each other in outer space, how we in interact on the high seas and in the air. And the work that's done in the SSD, which will be held on Monday, feeds directly then into the discussions in the strategic track that Secretary Kerry and State Counselor Yang will have uh, the next day on Tuesday. And then directly following the uh, SNED uh, principal sessions on, on Tuesday will be the uh, CPE, the High Level Consultation on People-to-People -People Exchange, uh, which, as I mentioned, is co-chaired by Secretary Kerry on the U.S. side and uh, by Vice Premier Liu Yandong on the Chinese side. These uh, discussions focus on as the name suggests, people-to-people -people exchanges. Those are a really important element in developing strong bilateral ties, uh, as well as in promoting mutual understanding. We've found that the CPE is an extremely valuable tool, and it has promoted uh, an abundance of exchange programs between students in the two countries, between scholars and academics, uh, between athletes, between artists, 
health experts, business people, local government leaders. It also drives programs like our important efforts to empower women. Uh, for example, this year, just to cite one example, um, the National Hockey League and the American College of Sports Medicine are joining uh, in, and uh, we're going to work on how we can get more people uh, with disabilities, more girls, for example, um, people who are underrepresented in sports into the game. The bottom line is this. The SNED and the CPE provide the U.S. and China a really important regularized platform to strengthen our relationship, to deepen our coordination, uh, to promote cooperation, and to narrow where we can or at least manage uh, our differences. And in that respect, it plays a very important role in uh, facilitating progress in the U.S.-China relationship and uh, U.S.-China cooperation uh, in the region and in dealing with global problems. So with that, uh, let me turn back to Cynthia and see we'll if you have any questions. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, in the interest of time, we do not have a lot of it. Out of respect for your colleagues here and the Assistant Secretary, please keep your questions short, to the point, and on point. We're here today to talk about the uh, SNED and the CPE. New York, if you have questions, approach the podium. We'll call you in due order. I will start here with Jeannie, and then we'll move across the front. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Please identify yourself. Okay. I'm <laughs> Ching Yi Chen uh, with Shanghai Media Group. Thank all you very right. much, Mr. Assistant Secretary and Cynthia. Um, regarding the issue of South China Sea, um, mm -hmm. in terms of a strategic uh, uh, dialogue or SSD, is the uh, United States looking forward to moving on on the agreements that reached by uh, President Obama and Xi Jinping last year in Beijing to avert military confrontation in Asia? And maybe you have some knowledge about the uh, issue about economic track. Is that well, well, the uh, uh, Renminbi joined in uh, IMF uh, SDR currency basket be discussed uh, this time. Thank you. Okay. Let me take the second question first. Um, my mother did not raise any children dumb enough to try to answer a question about currency. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that to the Secretary of the Treasury. On the first question, there is a unwavering determination uh, on the part of the United States to avoid military confrontation, uh, including with China. Uh, that serves no one's interest. And frankly, that is not the issue that faces us in the South China Sea. As important as the issue of the South China Sea is in uh, the U.S.-China discussions, it's not fundamentally a, an issue between the U.S. and China. This is an issue between China and the other claimants. It's an issue between China and the uh, ASEAN countries. And frankly, it's an issue between China and international law. It's a question of China's future and China's choices. If China, as it grows, is committed to act in concert with international law and global norms. If China, as it grows, is uh, determined to maintain strong, healthy, positive relationships with its neighbors, then we would hope its behavior in the tense area of the South China Sea would reflect that. 
The recent announcement uh, out of Beijing that uh, the Chinese government intends to continue the, uh, and expand the construction of facilities on the uh, reclaimed uh, outposts that it's been constructing in the South China Sea is troubling, not just to us, but to the countries in the region. Uh, frankly, we're concerned. and. Others are concerned. The simple fact is that neither that statement nor that behavior contributes to reducing tensions. And reducing tensions is what we all should want. Certainly, the prospect of militarizing those outposts runs counter to the goal of reducing tensions. And that's why we consistently urge China to cease reclamation, to uh, not f construct further uh, facilities, and certainly not to further militarize uh, outposts in the South China Sea. But we make that same request to all of the claimants, all of the claimants. It's a matter of good policy. It's a matter of good neighborliness. And frankly, it's a matter of common sense. It's an essential ingredient to creating the space that will allow for a peaceful resolution, that will allow for a diplomatic uh, settlement of the disputes. There are a couple of principles here. The principle of good relations. We want China to have good relations with all of its neighbors, as well as with us. Uh, the principle of freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight is indeed at stake here. The unacceptability of coercion or the threat, let alone the use of force. The importance of not impeding lawful commerce, especially in uh, an important waterway like the South China Sea. The necessity to make one's claims to territory in ways that are fully consistent with international law, such as the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. The principle of peaceful resolution of disputes through diplomacy or through arbitration. And fundamentally, the principle of exercising restraint. And that's a principle that uh, China and the other claimants uh, committed to in writing in 2002. It's a principle that should uh, govern the behavior of all of the claimants. I was with Secretary Kerry last month in Beijing when he made these points very directly very eloquently uh, to China's top leadership. Uh, and for sure, uh, this discussion will continue uh, in the SSD as well as in the uh, SNED. That's where we conduct diplomacy. Uh, what we're looking for is a region in which disputes are dealt with through di peacefully through diplomacy. What we're looking for is a South China Sea in which the smallest fishing boat from the Philippines or Vietnam or Malaysia has the ability to traverse international waters with the same confidence that the largest American warship can demonstrate in uh, the same space. Thank you. Thank you. Go here a second. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm Hui Wang uh, with CCTV America. Mm -hmm. yeah. As we know, President Obama said last week that the US should not let China write rules of world trade, and the US should be the one to do the job. 
since uh, the SNED is getting on the way. So I'm wondering if you agree that there's a reason for these two world's biggest economies to maybe join hands and write those rules together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, let me say that the United States has uh, not only welcomed but has assisted uh, China's entry into the organizations that write uh, the rules for world trade. Uh, the U.S. assisted uh, China in its entry to the WTO. Uh, the United States uh, welcomed and supported uh, China in the G20. Uh, the United States uh, works very closely with China in APEC. And uh, because uh, Ch China is such a huge uh, trading nation and trading uh, partner for the United States, of course, on a bilateral basis, uh, we work together very closely. And there's no doubt that uh, both countries and the uh, world benefit from uh, cooperation between the U.S. and China on trade and on economics uh, more broadly. This is always uh, an important topic of discussion in the economic track in the SNED. But, <laughs> not so fast. <laughs> the reason that the U.S. government and the, particularly the President of the United States is absolutely determined to complete the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Agreement uh, and then move on to the, uh, the Atlantic for the TTIP agreement. The reason that the, uh, the White House and the leadership in Congress right now are working to uh, put the uh, pieces together to complete the, uh, the uh, fast track authority, the TPA and the TAA uh, agreements is because these are essential elements to our effort to ensure that the rules that are written are good rules for global trade. We are unleashing a race to the top. We are pursuing and will succeed in putting in place a 21st century trade agreement that creates unprecedented high standards and unprecedented uh, economic opportunities in the first instance for the 12 partners to the TPP, um, but ultimately uh, for the entire region and for, uh, for the world. And that this is hugely important to uh, all of us. Okay. I'm going to go into the middle here, then to the back, and we'll try to get back up to the front. Sorry. Thank you so much for your <laughs> thank you so much for your remark. I'm Jennifer Chen, uh, reporter with Shenzhen Media Group. Uh, I just wonder what's your expectation on the cyberspace discussion this time, and what's the possible time for U.S. and China to re-establish a cyber dialogue? And also, we know Chinese uh, fugitive Yang Xiuzhu is seeking asylum. As far as you are concerned, what will be the possible response from U.S.? Thank you so much. Great. Um, on the second question, I, I'm sorry, but I uh, can't speak to uh, an issue of law enforcement. Um, cyberspace is one of the important dimensions in which the U.S. and China interact and in which the U.S. and China must cooperate. We are the two biggest consumers of the Internet. Our businesses, our organizations, uh, and our people are vulnerable. The President said yesterday that the intrusions and attacks uh, against us all aren't going to stop. If anything, they're likely to accelerate. And that requires that we significantly enhance our capacity to uh, safeguard 
the information and the interests and the ability of our citizens to utilize cyberspace. You know, many, many major uh, IT companies, U.S. companies in the main, operate extensively in China. And so protecting cyberspace, protecting internet te and communications technology, protecting the integrity of uh, the, the cyber s system is critically important, not only to U.S. businesses, but to the Chinese economy. So we each have an important interest. Uh, that means that there is a need for dialogue. It means that there is a need for real transparency between us. Uh, and it means that there's a need for cooperation. So we're both vulnerable. Um, this is an issue that will be discussed, I, I'm confident, uh, in both the strategic track and the economic track of the SNED. It will also be discussed without a doubt in the uh, SSD, the Strategic Security Dialogue, really is germane to uh, building a relationship of uh, trust between the U.S. and China. Uh, it's an important common concern. And I, for one, wouldn't be surprised uh, to see a conversation even in the people-to-people -people realm that touches on cyber because social media, because uh, access to information, the development of the knowledge economy is really critical to every aspect of our societies and every aspect of uh, our relationship. Um, so the, the cyber set of uh, issues clearly uh, will be an important uh, component of the upcoming dialogue. Okay. We only have time for one more question. I know there's lots out there. I'm going to go right back to the second in the, no, I'm sorry, right. Second in? Yes, right there. Uh -huh. You hit the cushion. I'm sorry. Okay, then if you don't take a microphone, the other guy will. Um, <laughs> Thank final you. question. <coughs> My name is Wada, I'm a Japan Smite newspaper. Uh, Secretary, thank you very much for doing this. My question is about North Korea. What kind of cooperation do you expect China to make this time around? I mean, what kind of pressure do you want Chinese to apply to the North Koreans so that they can come back to the nuclear talks? Thank you. Well, the the good news on uh, North Korea is that there is a very close alignment uh, between the U.S. and uh, China, uh, and obviously uh, the ROK and Japan are uh, very closely aligned with us. I think uh, we could put Russia in the same category on the goal. The goal is the verifiable and complete the irreversible denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, which means, for all practical purposes, the denuclearization of North Korea. All of us want to avoid a crisis, uh, and all of us are firmly committed to fully implementing the UN Security Council resolutions that categorically prohibit North Korea from continuing down the track of um, developing ballistic missile technology and developing uh, nuclear capabilities. That's the good news. So we're aligned on what the goal is. The bad news is that North Korea, which itself has committed clearly, directly, authoritatively under the 2005 joint statement to the complete denuclearization of uh, of the peninsula and has affirmed that that's the goal of the six-party talks is in continued defiance. Now, North Korea harbors the fantasy that it can 
have its cake and eat it too. North Korea is hoping uh, to be able to rescue itself from the uh, economic failure of its system through external aid while simultaneously and brazenly carrying forward on its nuclear and missile program. That's just not going to happen. However, North Korea has the option of tapping into the goodwill of the international community simply by honoring its own commitments, by coming into compliance with the UN Security Council resolutions, and by beginning credible, authentic negotiations on the nuclear issue. In the upcoming dialogue, we have uh, opportunities both in the uh, SSD and in the strategic track of the SNED uh, to talk through and think through together where things stand now with North Korea, as well as to ask ourselves how we can uh, further adjust our posture to accelerate the realization on the part of North Korea's leadership that negotiations to end their nuclear program are the only path available to them that allows for uh, economic uh, growth. And that's what we will uh, discuss. And with that, I'm very sorry. We have to close the briefing. We are now officially off the record.